Hello everyone, Emeron here. So the day's finally here. The Cyberpunk Edgerunners Mission Kit is now officially out. You'll all be reading it. And I am so excited to finally be able to talk openly with all of you about it. And it has been one hell of a month so far. And I need to talk to you about something that's been kind of playing out since the start of May. Near the beginning of May, I was offered an opportunity to be one of a group of proofreaders for the mission kit. So the box set has a little credit sheet in there and below the very talented people of Artel Serene Games, my name is listed as one of the beta readers slash playtesters. And I cannot describe to you how excited I am to see my name as part of the product and part of bringing this to life. And I want to start off by thanking uh, so profusely the talented people at Artel Serene Games for offering me the opportunity to be part of that group and to do the part that I did in bringing this thing to life, however small that might be as a contribution. The second thing I want to do as a shout out is to Rob Barefoot. Those of you who have been around a while may know him as Dice TTRPG. He is the media ambassador for Artel Soaring Games. This is the first official product that lists him in the credits as media ambassador. And I am so incredibly happy for him. And it is an incredible honor to be listed alongside him in the credits for this book. Rob, congratulations for coming to this point where your name is in an official uh, Cyberpunk product. You may be part of the company now, but that doesn't change the fact that this is how you got to be part of the content creation space. And through you, I have joined it as well. And I am so incredibly happy for you. And I am so incredibly honored uh, to be able to celebrate this with you in my own small way. So congratulations and thank you again for the opportunity to be able to review this early as media. I so greatly appreciate it. Now that that's out of the way, everyone, let's dive into the Edge Runners mission kit. So I'm going to be reviewing this thing relatively systematically. We're going to go through each book bit by bit. The one exception to this, obviously, is going to be the jacket. The jacket obviously is a gig. It has story. It has characters. It has surprises. It is full of stuff that would be terrible if I spoiled it. So I'm not going to do that. I am smarter than that. I am respectful and I hate spoilers for myself. I have friends that hate spoilers as well. I know there are plenty of you as well out there who, like some of my friends, ordered a physical copy, haven't gotten a digital copy, and you will not be getting a digital copy because you've already bought a copy in physical. I respect that, 100%, good on you. And so, out of respect for you, I will not go into the jacket in depth. I will talk about my very general impressions of it, but I will not be covering any story beats, any character stat blocks, any of that. That whole part of the box, I'm going to leave alone for now. There will come a video a few weeks down the road here. I'm going to give it two, maybe three weeks to let that all simmer, let you all get your copies, read through it as GMs, play through it as players, do the things that make the product special before I open the Pandora's box of spoilers and risk some of you uh, listening to me on your other monitor and potentially getting spoiled because autoplay decided to be mean to you. So that said, let's start with the Edge Runners Handbook. The Edge Runners Handbook is quite simply a lore book. It is both a rehashing of some things that those of us who have played Cyberpunk Red for some time will be familiar with, including a timeline leading us forward out of the 1990s, the collapse, things that we've been hearing about to some degree since the early editions of Cyberpunk from the 80s up to now, where we stand with the 2070s being fully revealed to us. So, there, or at least to 2076 where Edge Runners takes place. So this means we now have a relatively, maybe lightweight timeline, but a timeline nonetheless, leading us all the way from 1990 to the end of the timeline where we currently sit in 2076 as of this kit. With that said, there are plenty of new and interesting bits of information in here. An example that I will give you, did you know that 2044 was the year where 
Netwatch officially decided that the old net was lost, data crash won, and the black wall would be constructed. I didn't, now you do too. And so it's very interesting to me that we are playing red predominantly in an era where the net has officially been declared lost just a year earlier or less, depending on when in the year that happened. Obviously, we don't know specifics and all of our timelines for our red games are going to be different anyway. But roughly a year ago is when Netwatch decided the old net's lost officially and completely. We cannot purge it. We're closing off the access points. It is done. That's incredible to me that we now have that date to like affix to that. There are several mentions also of things like the bird flu, the Caribbean exodus, all of these things that we begin to see the end results of in 2077 and in the anime and that we just didn't have much context for outside of some random data shards and maybe the world of 2077 world book that came out a few years ago. And some of that is really low fidelity. It's not particularly detailed uh, in the, the world book or in the data shards. It's, you know, on the ground accounts, most of it. So this gives us a little more firm information. And I really have enjoyed reading through it. I'm not going to go too deep into detail with it in case you want to read it as well. Um, but of course, there is plenty here to be read. At the very beginning of this book, we are given the Edgerunner's Handbook in spirit through Mike, uh, Maximum Mike, Mike Pondsmith's self-insert in-universe character. The entire forward to this book is written by him, and he has just picked us up off the pavement. We are an Edgerunner in Night City, or we're about to be, and this is the data shard he dumped in our pocket telling us, this will save your life. Read it, understand it, and understand it well. So with that moving forward, we have a couple of little subsections in here. Again, I'm not gonna go over too much of this in high detail because I do think you should read it. I know that I was in my Discord with several other people today talking about it as they were reading it. And a lot of what they had to say, I think comes from getting a chance to read this relatively spoiler free. So I'm gonna offer all of you that same opportunity. Of course, like I said, about half this book is information we knew to some degree here or there before. And the other half is going to be some new information. So we have a couple of subchapters here. One is on cyberpsychosis, talking about kind of the modern understanding of that in the time of the uh, 2070s and how it's evolved. One of the major advancements here that we can't go without talking about really is the Neuroport. Neuroports are to the society of cyberpunk the smartphones that we have agents no longer exist ai got a little too friendly and so now we are left with hollow phones which are connected to our neural ports uh our cyberware is all connected to our neural ports and so this is a good and a bad thing you can take your neural port at character creation for free you get no humanity loss you suffer no negatives to your uh, investment in the beginning of the game so that 2550 yetis you can take at full character creation are all safe you do not need to do anything with those to afford this with that said there are some things here that we need to talk about the first thing is it connects to the outside world the outside world can connect back those of you who have wondered long and hard about how the hell does quick hacking work quick hacking works on the neuroport the neuroport is a central hub for all of your cyberware cyberware doesn't work without a neuroport so you need the neuroport therefore you can be quick hacked it's great it's fun we love it it's so good so there's that but the neuroport does to its credit come with a couple of very cool bits of cyberware. Obviously there's the hollow phone, like I mentioned, you've got some chipware sockets, you've got a interface plug, you've got virtuality built into it. Uh, there's just a ton of stuff that this gives you and it gives you all of the slots that a Neuralink would give you in the time of the red. So you have five slots on this thing, plus all those uh, doodads and features that cost no uh, slot loss, humanity loss, any of that. So that's pretty cool. Like there is a good trade-off here. Anyone that needed an interface plug to do things like, I don't know, use smart guns or to net run, 
you just have a free interface plug, no trouble at all. And that's just crazy. That's so good that you now no longer need to pay for that with humanity or with money. Because a lot of that was very expensive after, you know, you took your Neuralink, you took your interface plugs, you were already looking at being down 46 humanity as a net runner in the 2040s. And now, I mean, if you're using an old school cyber deck, you don't need to spend a thing in terms of your humanity. You can just net run off of a cyber deck. No problem. Now that said, if you want a quick hack, you're going to want a newer cyber deck. And those do come with humanity losses because that requires an implant in your neck. And so that is, you know, in with the new, out with the old kind of philosophy, you know? It's good though. It's it's ultimately very well done. I feel like the way that the lore leans up against the systems that we'll explore later in this video is very well done. So ultimately, I have no complaints. The chapter on cyberpsychosis is very interesting because it gives a more modern understanding to cyberpsychotic episodes and behaviors. And it kind of starts giving us an explanation for why some of these things might exist. But again, just like with anything else, it is based on a lot of supposition and more than a little maybe corporate influence. You know, the, the it's a problem, but we aren't ready to have the full conversation that maybe it's the corporations doing some shady shit and ruining society that's causing some of the things that lead to cyberpsychosis. You know, just a thought, just, just a thought. Uh, but that said, the little bit of understanding we do have and the understanding that certain cyberpsychosis uh, victims can be treated in the same way that Regina has us trying to incapacitate them in the time of 2077, all of that plays in here. So that is going to be good information for you to read and just contextualize yourself especially given some of the changes that we'll talk about later to things like humanity and uh, the new street drug. Immunoblockers are on the menu. And let me just tell you, they are a fun double-edged sword to play with. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the net. So the net, as you might uh, expect, is it's different than the time of the red, but it's kind of the same. City nets, still the way of it. Ziggurat, they're gone. Why is Ziggurat gone? They may have made some mistakes with AI. So the agents, I I just am saying, I think Ziggurat had something to do with the agents, guys. They, they were ripping holes in the net that Netwatch was no longer happy with. So they're gone. Netwatch subsumed them and the city net program as a whole. That's why I think in the time of 2077, when we were asked to go after the Voodoo Boys and Netwatch is some somehow involved in the middle of all that, we start to understand why they might be. So this is very interesting, I think. I think the net chapter, I'm a net runner main, of course, so this this is all to be taken with a certain grain of salt, but I think the net chapter is fascinating. It gives us a lot of detail on how the net has evolved out of the data crash into the time of the red, and then out of the time of the red into the modern day of 2076, where the kit takes place. So all of that said, you have a lot of good information here to consider and think about and really weigh out, you know, what you think about all of it. So the next bit of technology that we're going to talk about is things like weapons. So your weapons have gotten a little bit of an upgrade. A lot of weapons in the 2070s have some kind of what they call a rebuild to them. So this is going to be either a power, a tech, or a smart rebuild. These are wonderful things that are just enhancements on good old fashioned firearms. Obviously, power weapons are just going to have higher quality internals. They can bounce bullets off of walls with accuracy. It's pretty cool. Tech weapons fire through cover. Smart weapons are kind of like they are in red but they've merged together a lot of systems to make them a sleeker package. They've also improved the ammunition to have a greater degree of accuracy than they did in the time of the red, where they were mainly playing with not micro missiles like we see in the 70s, but mostly with like little grid fin designs where they'd self adjust midair. This has allowed for a greater degree of accuracy and I'm a nerd. So this is all probably gonna fly past several people's heads. 
moving on. Once we're through the firearms section of this, uh, we finally come up against the chapter on Night City. This is dense. I'm not going to cover this in much detail, but suffice it to say, this gives us a bit of Night City history in the same way as the Red Core rulebook gave that to us with some additional information of the decades that followed. We have a summary of what they call the Red Decades, which is also known as the Time of the Red, as well as the Unification Wars of the 2060s, and then finally the modern era of the 2070s. It is beautiful. There are informational bits on every district in Night City. There is, you know, famous locations in each part of the city. It's really good. It just, it's really good. It's gonna be great for those of you who maybe want a sightseeing list for 2077, because as far as I can tell, all of these locales are visible within the game. I've just recently gone to a nightclub named Empathy in the city center recently, and I uh, realized like, holy shit, this is where that one gig takes place. Not thinking about, well, of course the club has a name. Of course the club has like a spot in the city, but when you're playing the video game, it all just kind of blurs by you to a certain degree. And taking this moment to read through some of these location lists and things like that caused me to slow down. I just started a new playthrough in 2077 in the last couple weeks. And as I read through this book and this section in particular, and start playing the game, I found myself playing it more as a citizen of the city and less as the edge runner trying to blast through the game to the very last part of it. And this is pretty incredible, honestly. I will probably talk about this some more later because there are other facets of the game that kind of talk to that. The life paths in particular do a pretty good job of that, but we'll cover that when we come to the rule book. For now, just know that this section of the book is a must read. I think that it really helps to contextualize the backdrop against which we're playing the jacket, which is a very good high level view of all parts of the city for the most part. The gig starts out in the Badlands and it kind of drags you around the city to most parts of it. There are a few that get left out for what I think will be obvious reasons when you look at the narrative being told GMs, but Ultimately, it gives a pretty good tour of the city in the same way that a book like Tales of the Red Street Stories does. Gives you a little taste of every district and gives you a little bit of an appreciation for them as you go through. So on to the next thing that we have here. Um, within the Night City chapter, there are also a couple of mentions beyond the districts. We also have the players of Night City. So this is similar to the people lists within the core rule book. These are going to give us the hot players of Night City between people like the Fixers, the MedTechs, all of that, that we will see regular interaction with in the time of the 2070s. And it's going to give us some pretty good understanding of the corporations at play, the uh, mega corporations in particular that are the leaders of the city and the individuals like Rogue, for example, that make up the social fabric of Night City. Once we're beyond that, we get to everyday life, which is going to be a conversation on what modern life looks like in the 2070s. And it's structured very similarly to how this is structured in the Red Core rulebook, with the difference here being this is talking about the 2070s. The Red Core rulebook obviously is talking about the 2040s. And so this is a pretty much must read chapter through and through because we're not really dealing with repeat information now. We're dealing with pretty much all new information, all highly contextual, and it's going to get your vibes going right for what we have to come in the mission and for playing a character knowing that this is the backdrop of the world that you're playing in. So beyond all of that, we finally, at the end of this book, have a section summarizing the Edge Runners crew and their backstories. And when I tell you there are some very cool surprises in this section, there are some really great stories, and there are a few of these I think that'll bring a tear to your eye. If you've watched the anime, you owe it to yourself to read this section of the book. And if you haven't watched the anime, I would still probably recommend reading through this. It does contextualize some of the elements of the jacket as that is sort of an epilogue to the anime itself. 
So prime recommendation would be to just watch the anime in its entirety, it's 10 episodes, and each one is only a little under half an hour. So you can burn through it in a day, maybe plan that with your play group so that all of you have a, at the least, fresh understanding of what you're about to walk into if you've watched it before. It has been out for a little while now. And if you've never seen it, then you'll understand why all of us cry when we hear I really want to stay at your house. It's great. So when we get to the end of this section, we have officially reached the end of the Edge Runner's Handbook, and we are on to the next section, which I may have recorded before this one. So I hope you all enjoy what is to come in the next section as we cover the rule book. All right, so next up we have the rule book. The book, as you might expect, is going to be the introduction for both new GMs who are looking to run their very first game using the jacket, as well as some new rules for existing players that have already played red and have a good grasp of the system already. The very first section of the book largely covers rules that old hat GMs of red are going to know already. These are things like skill resolution, stat definitions, things like that, that pretty much every one of us who have read the Red Core rulebook will already be familiar with. That said, there are a few new additions in this section that are worthy of note. The first is a bit of a redefinition of two terms that everyone is going to be familiar with, critical success and critical failure. Critical successes are now being referred to as explosions. Critical failures are now being referred to as implosions. This is due to the fact that, for those of you who are new to red, when we roll a d10, which is our check die, not a d20 in this system, if you roll a d10, you roll a 10, you are not instantly going to succeed. Similarly, if you roll a one, you are not going to fail instantly. Instead, in both cases, you roll a second d10. If you rolled a 10 on your initial check, you then roll that second 10 and add it. In the other direction, if you roll a one, you first add the one to your initial skill base, then roll that second D10 and subtract it from that total. By doing this and redefining the rules this way, it makes it much clearer to newer GMs and players alike the exact mechanics and how they're supposed to work given this method of resolving criticals. And it doesn't imply that they will instantly succeed or instantly fail like the old terms did. This, I think, is a net benefit for everyone involved. The next rule in the book is going to be clarification around the rule of cool. So the rule of cool is something that has been talked about for some time, both within the community, and I believe it was talked about a little bit in the core rule book, uh, as I believe in sections talking about running cyberpunk near the back. Um, this is the idea, the principle, if you will, that we don't need to follow the rules exactly for the game to work the way we want it to work. Instead, the rules are there to provide us guidelines so that when we're doing either more mundane or systematic things, they can be resolved in a neat, orderly way. However, there are times where players, I've seen plenty at my table, Neon Inferno has plenty of evidence of this, come up with something totally batshit insane and they want to do something that the rules don't have judgment on. They don't have a clean cut, this is how you resolve your player trying to suplex a maelstrom gonk off the top rope uh, of a building and into the pavement below. It does have a couple of rules for things related to this, but obviously it's going to come down to you as a GM determining how does this resolve. The rule of cool is, I think, one of the most fundamental elements of cyberpunk as a game, and it's one of its shining stars in terms of things that make the game interesting to play and fun for everyone at the table. The fact that this now clarifies some elements of when this is appropriate and how GMs should use it is incredibly good. It's incredibly useful for GMs and players both to have this to refer to so that when the GM looks at the player saying they want to grab the officer and then shoot them in the head all in one round, the GM knows like that's two different rule actions. You can't do that. You have to grab them first and on your next turn, you can shoot them. And while this may feel a little more anticlimactic, obviously we need to keep balance in mind as this is a game at the end of the day. That said, if the player instead said, I want to grab the cop and move them 
behind the car. And the way I wanna do that is I wanna jump over the hood, tackle them and drop down to the ground with them. Well, that sounds a lot more feasible. And we are definitely able to do that within the rules provided. And none of that violates action economy. So now having this to refer to new GMs and be able to get them on the same page as every one of us who understand the principle fairly well, it's a great thing, honestly. I don't think that there's anything wrong with this, and I think it's quite a good thing to be able to just point at this and say, new GM, go here, refer to this. It's going to help you learn this concept and make sure that it's being run fairly, mostly fairly at your table. The next new set of rules here that are integral to understanding the character sheets provided in the mission kit are the rules around so-called weapon rebuilds. Fans of the anime and 2077 will recognize these as smart, tech, and power weapons. These are the weapons that are kind of everywhere in the time of the 70s, and they largely are going to expand what's possible within your standard weapons that Cyberpunk Red had released. Ultimately, when you're applying these to a weapon that didn't start that way, they're going to just take a couple of the upgrade slots up on that weapon in order to provide the benefit of a tech, smart, or a power weapon, uh, which are all covered within the book itself. And ultimately, these did have to be designed at some point in the last 30 years between the time of the red and the time that the kit takes place. And the fact is that they could exist in the time of the red if your tech invents them. And barring that, they are just fun, so I would just include them. They're a great time. Another new system in the rulebook is an official system for surprise attacks and ambushes. While these rules have been in the game in some form since the very beginning, they were a bit of an improvised amalgam of other rules that kind of all co-interacted. And while I believe there is some mention of this in the combat sections of the Red Core rulebook, Having one succinct section where you can refer to new players and GMs so that they can see how this is supposed to work is incredibly welcome. And I think that this will help prevent some of the uh, asymmetries between players who maybe played at one table and they ran ambushes one way versus another table that interpreted the rules interacting a different way. This just lines up all of those interpretations, puts them in one spot and makes it easier for GMs and players to refer to that spot so that they can know exactly what the ambush looks like and how that's supposed to resolve in terms of things like rate of fire and everything else. Um, before we get to the final new rule here, I'd like to make an honorable mention to the shortened critical injury tables that are present in the book. Uh, and they reflect 1d6 tables instead of 2d6 like it's in the standard core rulebook. This is so that the kit is a little more easy to run and it bounds the amount of injury that the players can receive. While it is entirely possible to still shoot someone's arm off in the time of 2077, it is more difficult in the context of the kit to get a treatment for something that horrific. And this is mainly just there to allow for bounding of that within the context of the mission kit. Uh, that said, you can take this out and replace it with the critical injury table in Red's core rules if you want to run that more true to how the game was initially designed. Uh, just understand that this is there to keep things simple, again, for new players, new GMs, because predominantly the Adrenor Mission Kit is a starter box and not an updated rule supplement uh, for red players that exist already. Um, the final new rule in this chapter is quick hacking. And it's probably the thing that I've seen the most anxiety and the most controversy around since it was announced. Uh, and I know there's also been a fair amount of excitement. I'm certainly in that camp. I have been really excited for net running. And I got a chance to kind of preview this back in Gen Con about a year ago. And uh, it was incredible. Honestly, it's just, it's a fun system. The fact is that I think they've done a great job keeping the idea of quick hacks as they're presented in Edge Runners in 2077 balanced 
while still preserving the identity of that hacker, being able to step on the battlefield and light people on fire, short circuit their cyberware, jam up their system, and even do some more dramatic things. I'm looking at some of the ultimate quick hacks. Those of you who have played the game will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, they have a variety of things here that you can do, and none of them are programs. None of them are things you have to worry about space for on a cyber deck. These are identical to core functions that a Netrunner has within the core rulebook, such as Backdoor, Pathfinder, and Cloak, uh, where you could just use them regardless of the cyber deck you're using. The only limiting factor on these is you do need to be of an adequate Netrunner rank to use higher rank quick hacks. Uh, these are separated by DV, so we have DV6, 8, 10, and 12, similar to how we see difficulty on things like files and control nodes within a network. Um, but once you're a rank four Netrunner, you have access to all of these. The only time where you're really gonna feel these limitations is if you take Netrunner as a second role on a character, or if your GM is starting a game where your characters start at a rank less than four, which is the standard starting rank for new characters. If you don't do that, you'll have everything from the very beginning all the way up through DV12 quick hacks. That said, obviously, these are not that easy to pull off. You do need to jack into your target and you'll need to survive getting booted from their system, which is by itself already relatively challenging if they notice that you're there. So those of you who don't wanna get quick hacked by Netrunners, I have one recommendation, put points in concentration. It is going to be your best friend. That or as Jay Gray has suggested helpfully on the RTG Discord, quote, break line of sight because they can't hack you without it. Simple. The second chapter of the rulebook covers the life path system. This is written for characters in the box, but could easily be used in the event that someone wanted to use this for a 2070 style campaign, as all of the life path categories generally line up, as far as I can tell, with those on a standard Cyberpunk Red character sheet. Um, generally, the life path here is wonderful. It gives us a lot of cultural fashion and other notes that are updated for the 2070s, including things like fashion styles, food sensibilities, and all of that. Um, it also updates several of the categories that make far more sense, such as your background, where reclaimers are really no longer part of the discussion in the 70s. Um, now they've been replaced with other categories. And overall, I think that this is probably the single most exciting part of things as because the life path has uh, kind of brought my head more into the 2070s. Recently, I've started a new playthrough of Cyberpunk 2077, and this has kind of left me uh, feeling more part of the city. It's led me to exploring the city more as a person living there rather than an edge runner just trying to burst through to the end of the game. And it's led me to discover some things that I otherwise probably wouldn't just because I am spending more time and trying to be more thoughtful and uh, methodical about how I navigate through that. So ultimately, I think this is really, really well written. The third and final chapter of the rulebook serves as the bridge between what has already been written for Cyberpunk Red and what is contained in the kit. As Jay Gray put it the other day on the RTG Discord, it is the section that, quote, can be considered as a source book for Red, unquote. When I say some of the things in this chapter are incredibly cool to think about in a Red game or a longer campaign, like the one that I run every week here on my channel, I think that that's honestly an understatement. This chapter is full of great new ideas and there are just a ton of them that I would never considered before and now I can't stop considering them. They are wonderful new additions to an already great system that we have. And I think that the more people look to use these and explore these, the better your games at home will be. Um, here, this includes things like some of the economy tweaks, humanity changes, the new gear, the new cyberware, the costs of everything, and rules for kind of integrating all of those into a more standard cyberpunk game played outside the confines of the kit. So the first thing that we see kind of after the forward section of this is a bunch of rules about uh, both quick hacking 
and direct connection net running. These two systems layer in pretty easily one to the other um, with a couple of not so minor differences between them, but they are very reminiscent of current Cyberpunk Red net running, and they're probably not gonna be too difficult for players to wrap their head around if you already know your net running system. And if you don't, I have a video for you on my channel. Uh, and if I remember to, I will link it right up here so that you can look at that and know how to set up some net running at your table, GMs. Um, that said, direct connection net running is pretty much what Lucy and Kiwi are trying to do to Tanaka in episode six of the anime, where you're plugging into someone's mind and trying to hack through their defenses. And when you come through on the other side, uh, you have control over their entire neural network. And by extension, you can leave viruses and things like that. Um, the main thing here is that it also lets you steal data out of their holophone and their mind. So any of their attached chipware sockets and things like that, you can just rob them of their data, which is fantastic. I like that. I like stealing things from rich corporations when it comes to, you know, cyberpunk. Cyberpunk. Anyway, going on from there, we come to the humanity rules. So we now have rules that are, I guess, more detailed examples. These though, I think if you look at the rules as given in the book, these are fantastic. I do think that these are some of the best additions and updates that the humanity system could have received. And I ultimately think that these changes change humanity from feeling more like a currency that you're spending on your character to a fluctuating meter of your character's sanity. And I think that this is going to have a larger impact on characters that choose to ride close to the edge, which is generally where I find myself when I'm playing the game. And so it's gonna be really interesting to see how this shapes some of those interactions because there are two general broader categories in this section. There are incidents and long-term environmental factors. So incidents generally describe something that takes place over a relatively short period of time, generally no more than a day, uh, or at the very least events that culminate in a single day. Some of it you might've been working towards for a while, such as vengeance or things like that. Other times though, it's generally pretty quick hit sort of things that are just kind of happening to you in a given day. Um, and these can apply both negatively and positively to your humanity. So you can, uh, in the same day potentially, uh, go out and like think maybe randomly murder someone, maybe accidentally, mind you, could be just manslaughter, but that doesn't make it any morally better. Uh, but you could be killing someone innocent, even by accident, and suddenly your humanity drops. And on the flip side of that, you can have it where you pull off uh, getting back at someone, whether that is killing them or, you know, imprisoning them or what have you, someone who has made your life worse. And if you do that, then you can gain humanity. Uh, you can also hold a little party for you and your friends where you, I believe the cumulative cost is like a thousand eddies, where you can all get together and have a little party on the rooftop and enjoy life for a night and regain some humanity that way. The long-term environmental factors are, I think, where this thing really shines though. Long-term environmental factors negatively include things like your lifestyle, Think if you're always living in a cube hotel, eating kibble, if you're one of the kibble and cube hotel enjoyers, as I like to say, um, you are going to have a bad time <laughs> if your GM uses these rules. Because the more you do that, the quicker you lose your humanity. And you can lose it very, very fast if you've chosen these things for yourself time after time after time. And so it incentivizes this change in approach where now you actually want to go out of your way to achieve things that grow your character and act in service of their goals and better their life and all of the expenses obviously that come with that and in the 2070s scarcity is kind of dropped by the wayside now that said just because it's kind of dropped by the wayside doesn't mean life has gotten any better right so we now have this lovely little micro uh, economy that we can look at month to month, even day by day of where is your humanity? And we get to just tinker with that. So GMs, you're going to have a lot of tools 
for melding player behavior at the table and tuning that more to be in line with their personal goals and achieving things that actually better their character's lifestyle. Players, I think, if you are roleplay focused type players, which I would hazard that most of you to at least a certain degree are, uh, I know my table that I play at and the tables that I have run always devolve into a degree of roleplay. Uh, and I mean that in the best way. We can get lost in the sauce with our roleplay. This is just one more tool in your toolkit now to roleplay toward a believable character, believable story. Uh, and I am just deeply excited to see how this plays when I finally get at a table where we're, we're doing this more regularly. Um, so finally, last but not least in this part of the book, uh, or in the rule book, I should say in general, we get to the gear section. So the gear is pretty interesting. Um, we've got one new street drug, several new weapons, several new bits of cyberware, many bits of that are, uh, most of it, I would say in service to the quick hacking system, uh, or at least half of it or so is. And the remainder are things that you're going to recognize from the game, from the anime, things like Manus Blades, things like Mono Wire, things like your projectile launch system, Berserk, your, uh, you know, Neuroport obviously is in here. Um, so all that cyberware is there. It's awesome. The weapons here are great. They're the iconic things that we can really remember from the video game. Things like the Nekomata, things like the Omaha, things like the Unity. All of these are there. We don't have any iconic weapons. I will say that, and that's okay. We don't really need them. I think that GMs, if you really want to try hard enough, we have enough of the sort of prototypical base weapons from the Edge Runners era and the 2070 era that you could, if you want to take some of the iconic items in uh, 2077 and translate them down to the tabletop. I think you have enough templates here that will allow you to do exactly that and uh, you know give them some neat representation within the actual tabletop game. That said, this is not a video game. It does not respect the rules of the video game. You could, in fact, have a Sandevistan, a Berserk, and have the ability to quick hack people all on the same character. You are not restricted to that. So it is very interesting because this opens up a whole new world of build possibility that wouldn't have been possible in the video game unless you modded it maybe. Uh, but even then, like this is just a whole different kind of ball game. And I am very excited to see what people are gonna come up with out of that. Um, ultimately though, I think that a lot of the things in this section make for very interesting thought experiments. And um, it's gonna be fun to see people kind of use these as templates for uh, homebrewing and tech inventions and all of that. Um, the one new street drug, which I have talked about in the shorts leading up to this video, is immunoblockers. And immunoblockers are a whole heap of fun. You can get humanity back really quick, really cheap. 2d6 humanity back, and that lasts you for a month. Or until the GM, like me, tells you that, I'm sorry, that was a little traumatic. Your immunoblockers ran out. Roll me resist drugs torture. DV21. And if you fail that, wow. Uh-oh. Time to start eating this like candy or you're gonna lose even more humanity than you gain. And the spiral continues. And I think that this is really great because it kind of leans into the humanity changes that we're seeing in the book. And I think that ultimately it really does allow for uh, a little more of that fluctuating humanity total that makes riding close to the edge interesting. And it adds a tool to pull someone back in an emergency from cyberpsychosis, which is really, really wild when we think of it that way. Um, so ultimately, that's kind of where the rule book ends. And all in all, I think that is a source book for Red. It's incredible as a tool for new GMs. It's really well written. I think that it gives a lot of really good insight and it gives a nice clear explanation of many rules that relied on several interlocking systems in the core rule book that now come together into one cohesive whole as things like the ambush rules or things like the uh, rules behind imploding and exploding dice where it's very clear kind of what you're gonna do about those sorts of things. Um, and 
on the other side of it, you have all of this great gear in the end that you'll be able to use and systems you'll be able to use in your core rulebook games that are fully expanded with character progression, full role rules and all that. All right. So with that, we come to the final book in the box, which originally I know at the beginning of this video, I promised I'd talk about the jacket as well. The problem with that, it's really hard to talk about the jacket without spoiling things or giving people information. And I have yet to run this for my table. I know several other groups that I am on the fringes of that also want to play through it. And I don't want to spoil it for any of them. Uh, and I know that their GMs would probably want to tear out my heart if I did that. So to compromise with those people, I'm going to give you a broad overview, first impressions, if you will, of what I think of the jacket. And I think I kind of said this in the start of the video. Anyway, it's been a couple days that I've been going back and forth recording and re-recording this. So uh, I apologize uh, for, for those bits of confusion. But that said, what I think about the jacket, it is quite possibly my favorite cyberpunk gig on paper, at least to date. It is the perfect adventure to have in an introductory product like this. It is a wonderful thing that I think GMs that are new to the game are going to have an extremely simple time running. Um, nothing is too complicated. The box gives you everything and more that you need to run this thing. And the mission itself is written with things like tips to the GM, scenery uh, enhancement so that you know how to describe it to your players. And it also has behind the scenes information about what's happening in the world and the rationale of the major players in a scene so that you, the GM, are never lost and your logic is sound when you're entering each scene here. You never have to second guess why is this happening? It is all spelled out for you in the book, even if your players maybe are unaware of some of those facts. And the book even instructs in several places not to tell your players certain things because they're mainly for you, the GM, to continue comprehending things so that you're not lost at any point. And that I think is truly one of the best parts of this whole uh, book is that it just allows you to run the game and it gets out of your way in every opportunity. And it has a bunch of really great endings that you can walk down. And uh, just like in 2077's video game missions, there are a lot of ways that these missions can end and there are a lot of ways that that reflects on your characters. And um, I think that, uh, you know, there is one very good ending, there's one very bad ending, and there's several in between, just like the video game. Uh, and in that way, I think that Artel Soaring Games has done a fantastic job of taking this gig from a franchise that was built, uh, you know, all those years ago, made into a video game, and they've now distilled the elements of what that video game did right and made feel so good to the players. And they've distilled that down to a perfectly serviceable and well-written uh, story for the tabletop. And for that, I am extremely excited to hear the experiences of players running through this mission. Um, Jay, Mike, you guys did a fantastic job. I don't know that you could have done better. All the people over at CDPR and Trigger that contributed to this, this is an, a, a wonderful product. I have really no harsh criticism whatsoever to offer. Uh, I think that you guys knocked it out of the park. The, uh, as as your, <laughs> one of your editors that uh, proof, proofread this thing right before uh, it released, uh, I have to say I also uh, am very impressed that even when we read through it, there weren't nearly as many typos or things like that as we've kind of found in first edition printings of other books. I think that probably this is one of the highest quality products that we've yet to see. And I can't wait to get the physical box in my hands to see what those all look like. I'll probably upload a separate video for that here. Um, and later on, I will do a separate video uh, full of spoilers, talking more in detail about the jacket so that I give everyone at least a couple weeks to get through that content before I say anything more about it. So that does it, everyone. Now, I'm going to go to sleep after a week full of shorts and full of making this video and reading this uh, amazing product. And I'm going to wake up tomorrow nice and early, go to my local game store 
and I'm gonna get my hands on the new Shadow Scar Easy Mode and play that with my friends. And I'm really excited to do that. So I'll have more for you very, very soon, both I'm sure on the Cyberpunk front, especially on the Shadow Scar front. So I hope all of you have a wonderful morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Stay healthy, stay safe, until we see each other again. Peace.